Yeah, go for it. That was awesome. <laughs> Remember I said musical genius? <laughs> Just a very short reading before we sing, and then Aida as guest speaker. Unitarian Universalism has had a long history with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was first introduced to Unitarian Universalism while a graduate student at Boston University in Massachusetts in the early 1950s, where he would go and hear the great Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Greeley, preach. A dozen years later, Unitarian Universalists sent more ministers to march with Dr. King in Selma in 1965 than any other denomination in the country even though we are one of the smallest denominations in the country. Two Unitarian Universalists were martyred there. Viola Luizo was shot in dead by the KKK while she was transporting racial justice activists to the airport. The Reverend James Reeb, a Unitarian Universalist minister, was beaten to death in the street by white men with clubs who were opposed to desegregation and voting rights for black Americans. Dr. King considered himself a friend of Unitarian Universalism, although if he were alive today at 93, he would look Unitarian Universalism square in the eye and say there's much left to dismantle about white supremacy culture in this faith. Tradition. The following words were spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association on May 18, 1966. One of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in great periods of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And there can be no denying the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our midst. I must say to you this evening, my friends, there are some things in our nation and in our world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon you to be maladjusted and all people of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to racism and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take the necessities from many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of people perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of prosperity. I must honestly say that I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism. I believe firmly that our world is in dire need of a new organization, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. <laughs> we need people as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day cried out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I want to be as maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation could not survive half slave and half free, as maladjusted as Jesus of Nazareth, who could say to the people of his day, you who live by the sword will perish by the sword. 
Though such maladjustments, through such maladjustments, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of racial inhumanity into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. I know that there are still difficult days ahead, and they are days of glorious opportunity. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony. Please be seated. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you one of my favorite people on planet Earth, Ida Jones. I, Ida is a person of integrity, of dignity, and of great strength and courage. She was president of the congregation in the first weeks and months of this pandemic and was part of the leadership team that moved us through those first uncertain days, days that continue even now. She is a devoted mother, a devoted grandmother, a beloved professor at Fresno State. Please welcome our own Ida Jones. Thank you. And do you want a check or cash for that? <laughs> Today's uh, sermon I titled, The Miner's Canary, Black Women, and the Labor Movement. Mississippi's first labor union was a union of washerwomen formed in 1866. How did that happen? Uh, these women weren't being paid very well or at all in some cases. So they adopted a resolution which they sent to the mayor and, asked, and told the mayor that they would be charging a uniform rate for their work. 20 years later, black women who served as domestic workers and laundry workers in Atlanta decided that they would join a, a union, or create a union, and they would also charge a flat rate for the work that they did. Not only did they agree to charge a flat rate, but they also uh, included anyone who was doing that kind of work, including white women. So not only were they a, black, uh, a, a union of black workers, they wanted to show that there was unity in the work that they were doing and trying to get fairness in the work. Black women have continued to uh, lead unions organizing in the industries that black women typically were the majority in. So in washers and laundries, um, restaurant, I would say servers, but they weren't the servers that we know now, but rather behind the scenes and doing the cleaning and, and uh, the other work behind the scenes. And you have had uh, black women who are leading those movements and continue to lead them through the um, 60s and beyond. So how did I get this title? Black Women, the Miner's Canary of the Labor Movement. Well, you may know what a miner's canary was, but I'll tell you, for those of you who didn't know, um, canaries were used by, first by British and then US and Canadian miners in the coal mines as a signal to uh, find out whether there were poisonous gases in the mines. Gases such as carbon dioxide was a common gas that would be in the mines, and the belief 
n now the belief that, uh, the, that canaries were the best representatives is because of apparently birds and canaries specifically breathe faster. So if there were poisonous gases, the canaries would die and that would tell the miners to get out of there because there were poisonous gases. Of course, now we would frown upon that uh, use, the use of canaries and, and since then we now have um, a, electronic methods of uh, identifying uh, when there are poisonous gases in the mine. So the canary served as an early warning of, in that case, danger. So the phrase, the miner's canary, has been used to note that what happens to black women uh, often has been a preview of the social and economic uh, uh, conditions that would occur to everyone. So we had those women in the 1800s who were forming unions, and what happened later? In the 1930s, well before that, the 1920s and 30s, workers began to unite, and uh, through a lot of um, trauma, uh, if you saw, um, oh, what was uh, the Flying Nun? What, what, Sally Fields, what was the movie she was in? The, yes, thank you, Coal Miner's Daughter. Thank you very much. Um, I, I always do that. I always, uh, you know, mess up the names. I have to write down names. Otherwise, they just, whoosh, they're gone. So thank you very much for that. Um, in that movie, you saw the trauma that she went through trying to participate in a uh, union. And if you haven't seen the movie, it's a really good movie. It's old, but it's really good. Um, and uh, it was in the 1920s and 30s that workers that were organized would be arrested, some would be beaten, they would be moved away from their homes and their families, all because they wanted to unite to get an opportunity to get more equitable treatment. Um, it was th that conduct that resulted in uh, the labor laws of the 1930s and 40s, the federal labor laws in the 1930s and 40s specifically authorizing employees to be able to join in unions if they want to. Doesn't that seem so, we assume that workers ought to be able to unite and talk to each other and create unions to organize, but that wasn't so um, acceptable in the early 1900s. The also, also the reason that I use the uh, miner's canary analogy is that if black women are able to help improve conditions, then that will also help improve conditions for other people as well. So sort of the rising tide idea that you start with uh, one group and other groups will be tre treated uh, better also. So how does this relate to our monthly theme of living with intention. Well, I believe living with intention means looking at past accomplishments and cast past deeds to figure out what you're going to do for the future. Now, how many of you made New Year's resolutions? Oh, not very many. <laughs> Maybe five on, on the virtual campus? Maybe you made them? <laughs> Why don't we more people make resolutions? Because they don't work. Right, I heard someone say that. They don't work. <laughs> right, you make the resolution on the first, and perhaps as late as the second. <laughs> that, relation, that, that goes by the wayside. <laughs> I, but I think it's okay to have your goals and resolutions for um, what you want to accomplish. Whether you do it at New Year, whether you, some people do it every month, some people don't do it at all, some do it once a decade, uh, you know, whatever the time is where you just sit and think about, well, what do I want to do? I've got to do something, right? And that's part of um, being Unitarian Universalist is that I've got to do something. But how do I do this in a way that I actually accomplish something? 
One of the things we should do is look at what we've done in the past. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples in a minute. Have we accomplished um, what we wanted? Or have we not done as much as we wanted to do? And why is that? Is there something else that needs to be done before you can accomplish whatever that task or that goal is? Is there something that can be added to tell us how we want to accomplish that goal? Through assessing what we've done in the past, we can better guide our journey to more of the same or different intentions for the future. So if you're planning and setting your intentions for the future, a necessary prerequisite is that you need to look at the past. Not to dwell on it, not to blame yourself, not to say, oh, if I'd been a better mother, grandmother, teacher, but just to look at what you've accomplished and to be sure to look at what you've accomplished, not what you didn't accomplish, although you can look at that too, but look at what you've accomplished, look at what you've done. That is an important part of living with intention. That can help guide you for those things um, that you uh, would like to do in the future. So raise your hand if you've ever had a goal to increase your fitness, eat healthier, or lose weight. It's always on my list of resolutions, too. <laughs> Ooh, okay, you can see that I still have a little bit of work to do to accomplish <laughs> at least some of that. But have you detailed what that really means? I have this game that I play on the computer. And I don't know, I, I think Google uh, watches me all the time, just as they watch the rest of us. And I always get these ads for if you buy these pills and drop them into a glass of water and you drink it, you can lose 17 pounds in 10 days. <laughs> I always get those ads. <laughs> I'm like, really? I mean, I'm not going to. You know, if that was really true, it would be all over the news. They wouldn't have to do one little ad after a game. Everybody would know about it. And they'd sell out of those pills so quickly. So anyway, but I always get that. So, you know, Google's paying attention to what I, I, I'm doing. So one of the things I wanted to do is to talk about how we use that concept of SMART goals to see if we can make uh, whatever choices that we make more intentional. Um, and I'll talk about SMART goals, although we've talked about it uh, in the past, but I'm you know, I'll give you some examples. So let's say my goal is to eat healthier. Okay, not the lose weight part, but at least eating healthier. What does that mean? What does eating healthier mean? More vegetables. Uh, who said that, more vegetables? Good. That's my goal, is to eat more vegetables. And so how do I do that? It's a more specific goal. So when you talk about SMART goals, it's more specific, right? Eat vegetables. Now, I will tell you, um, I have been toying with being vegan. Um, and uh, some of you may, yeah, I said toying with. I said that on purpose. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> because my excuse is it's really hard to do. And to a certain extent it is, because you have to adjust what you think of as acceptable. So I've been eating more vegetables. Unfortunately, some of those vegetables include potatoes. <laughs> They're vegetables, right? Oh, oh, you, you want to change my goal to green vegetables, huh? That's huh, all. <laughs> okay. Be even more specific, green vegetables. So that would exclude potatoes, though. I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> but certainly that's a more specific goal, eating vegetables and even green, eating green vegetables is an even more specific goal. So now how do you measure that? There are lots of ways to measure it. The way I'm measuring it now is I try to eat green vegetables, and they are green vegetables, at the end of the day. 
where when I usually reach for something sweet, I reach for a green vegetable. Um, so that's more measurable, right? Because I know at the end of the day, if I've done it, then yay. And if I haven't done it, nah, okay, next time. Uh, and then the goal has to be attainable, something you can actually accomplish, right? Not uh, from starting tomorrow, I'm only going to eat healthy. Because you know what will happen by tomorrow night. Oh, I've eaten healthy enough to, uh, during the day. I'm just going to eat healthy, uh, more unhealthy, just for a short time. So, and it undoes all the things that I was trying to accomplish. But attainable means a shopping list. It means prepping veggies in advance. That's what helps me is if I have the vegetables there in the fridge and I can open the fridge and see them right there, okay. Um, they have to be relevant. And in that case, it's easy because it's my own personal goal. And then time bound. What period of time am I going to do this? Well, the, the goal would be every day. Um, I, the scientific research says it takes about six weeks to develop a habit. So I'm going for six weeks where I do that and hopefully it will then become um, manageable. Now that's an easier kind of smart goal. I won't have time to go through the detail of the second e example, but let me just start it at least. My second example is I want to do more to follow the, the principle of believing in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's one of our core principles. That's sometimes hard to do. I mean, do you know people that you have a hard time appreciating? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all do. Whatever the reason is, we do have people that we have a hard time appreciating. But that inherent worth and dignity is too, is too big to try to implement as a goal, right? So what would I do? Um, the example I'm going to, to use is, I, I think I told you last week I'm kind of a computer geek. Um, and uh, I use Nextdoor, this app, to find out about my neighbors. And I'm not all that happy about them, but uh, <laughs> at least some of them. But one of the things that bugs me is they talk about the unhoused people and the encampments that they've uh, built. And, and they talk about it ad infinitum. Um, and so my, what I'd like to do is to, as a more specific goal, give them more information so that they can get a more complete picture. So how do I do that? Well, I get myself in trouble <laughs> because <laughs> when they start talking about it, then I bring up information. Specifically, I link to websites that discuss the issues of being unhoused and how that happens and what it means and some of the solutions. Now, for, the, for many on the app, they're concerned that their property values are going to go down or that they can't walk to the store or they can't go to the store. Um, and, you know, my answer to them is, of course you can. But, but you have to see people as people, not as someone who's unhoused. They're a person. And how we define a person isn't by a specific characteristic. So um, I could call you orange pants wearer. That's who you are, right? And that's all I'm going to call you. I don't say anything about you. I don't talk about the kind of work you do and you know, working in a nursing home and all the good stuff that you do. I just call you orange pants wearer. That's not, I'm sorry for picking on you. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> this is Jamie's friend, so I'm hoping I'm not uh, severing the friendship by picking on you. Uh, and, and that's not my intention, but rather to just pick out, how do you define someone by one characteristic? Well, you can't, because we are more than just one characteristic. And so I, I um, 
am doing more to try to inform the people on, in my neighborhood about the situation. Um, the other thing that uh, we had done as a family was to prepare packages and deliver them to people who were uh, unhoused and in encampments. One of the things that we specifically did, though, is to talk to people. Don't just hand them a bag and say, okay, good luck. We talked to people. And it reminded me again of the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, it was so amazing at several of the encampments, they, uh, the person who took the bags started handing them out. They didn't just hoard them all, right? I mean, our presumption, sometimes people's presumption is that, oh, they're not gonna care about anybody else. They're just gonna take because that's the way we are, right? Sometimes we don't care about anybody else. If I've got some candy, I'm not gonna share it with you unless you make me. <laughs> um, and sometimes we do that, right? We get something and we just don't share it. But it was, it, it was so awesome to see how they were sharing. They would go from, and this was a really, really cold, windy day, so there weren't a lot of people who would come out. They went from door to door and handed out the, the uh, bags to people. Um, it, was, it was really amazing. And so um, to wrap up, since I can't go through everything because I've run out of time, living intentionally can be challenging. And maybe you can think of the other ways that you fill out the other part of the SMART goals in, in that situation. Living intentionally can be challenging. But first we have to look at what we've done and then look at what we want to do and celebrate for ourselves those things that we have accomplished and look forward to the things that we plan to accomplish in the future. Thank you.